Hello, uh, this is the talk on Volantis Spark, Secure and Flexible Private Transactions. I'm Aaron. And I'm Adam. And we'll start by introducing a bit of the uh, history of transaction protocols and then talk about some of the issues that uh, Spark aims to solve. First of all, just brief disclaimers um, that my company, CypherStack, receives funding from the Firo project in part for doing research and development that includes Spark. Um, and I've also previously received funding to do Monero related research and development. Um, and we will discuss Monero briefly um, in the context of transaction protocols. And further, we're going to try to avoid going deep into unnecessary gory mathematics and notation just in favor of design clarity. Um, if you want the gory details, uh, we recommend reading the preprint, which is part of this conference proceedings, or is at the link below. Uh, Aram, can you talk a little bit about uh, kind of what transaction protocols aim to do? Yeah, sure. So we are talking about the privacy payment protocols, which aims to fix the confidentiality issues on Bitcoin. You know, the initial Bitcoin design has been relying on its transparency. So all transactions have been fully transparent. You can trace the origin, the amount, and the receiving addresses of all transactions from the very starting date of Bitcoin. And the uh, privacy protocols uh, comes to solve this to solve these financial privacy issues. Right, and in general, um, there's kind of account-based protocols and non-account-based protocols. Um, we'll talk about mainly non-account-based protocols, and those operate basically by having transactions that consume unspent containers of value and generate new containers of value. And in most transfer-type transactions, uh, the generated and consumed values have to precisely offset each other to ensure that there's no inflation. Um, but in other types of transactions, the most common being coin-based transactions, you may have new value entering the system according to rules that depend on your protocol. And just as a matter of notation here, um, we'll often refer to containers of value as coins here and in the preprint. Um, other protocols might use terms like outputs or notes, uh, but these mean roughly the same thing. Um, and as Rob had mentioned, um, a lot of early protocols like Bitcoin were transparent, where the transaction data um, was typically publicly verifiable and in the clear. But there's risk involved in that. So more advanced protocols and more recent protocols are what we might call opaque or private. Um, while being publicly verifiable, they still try to protect one or more uh, parts of the transaction, like the value associated to the coins involved, the destination of newly generated coins, and uh, which coins are being consumed in the transaction. Um, and I know, Aram, you had wanted to speak a little bit about, um, we'll come back to some other examples in a second, but I know, Aram, you'd want to discuss a little bit about the design of Firo, um, which kind of led to the development of Spark. Yeah, so Firo was one of the first cryptocurrencies I mean to solve the Bitcoin privacy issues, and he went through at least four different privacy protocols before reaching out, before getting to the point that we are going to deploy Spark. So Firo has started from the protocol called ZeroCoin, one of the first zero-knowledge cryptography-based uh, Bitcoin privacy protocols. But ZeroCoin was not computationally efficient, and eventually its, uh, its soundness also had been found to be broken. And Firo has switched to another protocol called Sigma, which uh, shares the same design concept of ZeroCoin, but is relying on totally different cryptography techniques which is more efficient, more computationally efficient, and also it has a proven soundness. But uh, both ZeroCoin and Sigma, they only partially solve the transaction, transactional privacy. They enable anonymity, so they, the, the origin of the transaction is hidden in the crowd, but they still don't hide the transaction accounts or they don't uh, they don't hide the receiving addresses. So Lelantus has been designed to provide also confidentiality along with anonymity. Like Sigma, it hides the, the sender origin, it hides the transaction origins, but it also hides the transaction amount. But Lelantus uh, kind of couldn't solve the, the first, the last, privacy, important privacy feature, which is uh, hiding also the rece recipient addresses. And also its security proofs have not been complete. So now we have came to Spark, we came to Spark, which solves all the three privacy features and has a proven security model. 
Yeah, and there's definitely, yeah, and there's definitely examples of, of other projects and protocols that try to achieve similar goals. We mentioned Firo. Um, there's approaches like Mimblewimble, which are implemented in different forms in projects like Veeam and Grin. Monero is a popular example, as is Zcash. Um, and, and it's interesting to note that in each case, um, including with Spark, there's different cryptographic approaches used toward very similar goals. Um, and it's also important to note that these often imply fairly complex and sometimes subtle trade-offs in privacy properties, efficiency, security, things like that. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about some of the design goals that we want um, a privacy protecting transaction protocol to have. We might want it to be trust-free in its parameter setup so that soundness doesn't depend on parties uh, perhaps you know, conducting an MPC or you know, throwing away secrets. We often want there to be space-time efficiency, that is, um, both space complexity and prover and verifier time efficiency for transactions. We'll want the design to be straightforward, modular, and have a formal security analysis that, at the same time, is fairly easy to analyze. We might want maximal consumed coin ambiguity, meaning that if our protocol is intended to hide or otherwise protect which coins are consumed in a transaction, kind of the set among which those coins may exist is as large as possible. We may want to flexibly offload different operations like transaction scanning, complex or expensive proof generation, or transaction signing to different devices or entities in opt-in fashion. We further might want additional opt-in visibility of transactions or accounts. And I know that we said that we're not dealing with account-based models, um, but it is possible to kind of abstract the idea of a wallet or an account away. And finally, we may want to be multi-signature friendly so that different entities can cooperatively sign and generate transactions in an indistinguishable manner. <clears throat> so Aram, can you talk a little bit briefly from this slide about uh, the way that Spark tries to achieve some of these goals? We may have lost Aram's audio. Um, so until he comes back, um, I'll go ahead and briefly outline this. Um, so as Aram had mentioned, Spark basically attempts to achieve some of these goals using a modular design, fairly straightforward cryptographic components, um, and a reasonable set of trade-offs. So all the components, for example, can be instantiated with public parameters, so there's no trusted setup process involved. And many of them can support what's called batch verification, which tries to amortize the cost of verification away from multiple transactions at the same time. The efficiency attempts to scale with different kinds of parameters, um, like the size and structure of those consumed coin ambiguity sets that I mentioned before. And finally, we have an in-progress implementation with a standard permissive license. So the goal being that this can be implemented and used widely to benefit the space. Um, Aram, is your audio back? Yeah, actually, I did notice I was muted, but please continue, Aram. Oh, no problem. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the overall kind of 30,000 foot design of Spark. So to start with, let's talk about the design of coins. And again, you might see these referred to as outputs or notes in other projects and protocols, but they mean roughly the same thing. The idea is that we have two commitments effectively that are hiding different aspects of the coin's value and its uh, identity, you might say. There's what's called a serial commitment, which hides the spend authority for effectively who can spend the coin later. There is value, which is hidden in a value commitment. Um, and then there's some encrypted recipient data. And the encrypted recipient data includes um, information about the spend authority so that the recipient can effectively recover that to spend the coin. The value is also included there, again, so that the recipient can view it and also later spend the coin. And there's additional arbitrary data, um, like plain text memos, which could be useful for uh, human readable purposes. And there's also additional components there, like range proofs, that are necessary to make the design work. The idea behind addressing is interesting. Um, what we want is something called diversified addressing. And there's similar approaches that are used in projects like Zcash and Monero. And the idea is that we want one private key to be able to generate an arbitrary number of so-called diversified addresses. And we don't want those to be externally linkable. However, unlike some previous approaches, and you can kind of see the left-hand side of non-diversified addresses, we have the one single key that's generating a number of non-diversified addresses. And if I have two coins over there and I want to identify which uh, diversified address they belong to, we normally have to scan each of those coins for each of those addresses, which scales very poorly. The idea behind diversified addressing is that we only have to scan each incoming coin once. 
and we can deterministically and uniquely identify which diversified address it's destined for. So this scales much better. That's the right-hand side of this diagram. Um, so Spark uses diversified addressing. Um, Aram, do you want to talk a little bit about the idea of how uh, membership proofs or one of many proofs hide consumed coin identity? Um, and yeah, better you continue just to keep this small. Oh, sure. Presentation. Yeah. Sure. So the idea behind consumed coin identity hiding is that we have a so-called membership or one of many proof. And what that does is it, uh, it asserts or proves in zero knowledge that the coins being consumed in a transaction belong to some specified set without identifying which one it is. Um, and further, that consumed coin data is re-randomized. And the reason it's done is to hide which coins being consumed while still allowing us to perform op uh, algebraic operations on that re-randomized coin. And finally, to ensure that we don't have double spending when we're hiding the identity of the coins being consumed, we have a verifiable random function derived tag, which we call the linking tag. Um, it's also similar approaches are called things like nullifiers or key images and other protocols and projects. That effectively allows for double spend protection by um, having a separate proof that we'll talk about in a second that asserts that this tag was uh, uniquely and properly generated. And uh, public verification can assert that as long as the same tag does not appear in multiple transactions, the same hidden coin is not being consumed. So let's talk a little bit about the key structure. So there's a hierarchy of keys in Spark that allows for this kind of opt-in visibility and uh, operation offloading we discussed earlier. So we have, of course, the spend key, which can authorize transactions, but we also have two different kind of derived keys. The spend key derives the full view key, and the full view key allows um, an entity that possesses it not to authorize transactions, but to be able to compute the balance by identifying incoming coins and outgoing coins. And it can also generate proofs um, that are often computationally expensive, but again, without actually authorizing a transaction that spends coins. And the full view key can be used to derive the incoming view key. And the incoming view key allows for an entity in possession of it to scan for incoming coins, um, but not outgoing coins and not authorizing transactions. And those are kind of all at the abstracted account level. We also have a structure called a payment proof that can prove particular transaction data that without allowing account level visibility. So a little bit more fine grained. Um, Aram, did you want to speak at all about kind of the uh, set membership proofs that we use? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, Lelantus Spark, along with his predecessors, Lelantus, is using one out of a cryptographic protocol called one out of many proofs. This, uh, this, uh, 2014 or 15 by Groth and Colways, and then uh, more optimized versions have, uh, have, have been designed. Uh, basically, they are uh, efficient Sigma protocols enabling to prove the knowledge of opening of one out of N standard Peterson commitments. And the best thing of these protocols is that they, they both are very computationally and uh, they, they are efficient from computational and communication uh, point of view. The proof sizes, size scales logarithmically, which is great. So which means that the, the proof can be generated against, let's say, and can grow up to 1 million, but the proof will still remain few kilobytes. The proof generation scales as ON Actually, it should be O n times log n, uh, but uh, yeah, still quite fast. And the best thing of one out of many proofs is that it's verification. The verification of a single proof is at all linear. Many proofs can be patched and verified in patch, which basically will make it scaling as O n over log n. And uh, it's worth mentioning that actually using this batching techniques, the marginal verification complexity will be effectively constant across the batch of separate proofs. This is what will make Sparks and other privacy protocols based on one out of many proofs being uh, re efficient in practice. Yeah, it's a really nice, nice construction. Uh, we mentioned being able to authorize transactions. Um, and there's a particular kind of proof that does this, we can perhaps call an authorizing proof. Um, and what that does is it asserts a couple of things. Um, it first asserts that the linking tags that are presented publicly in the transaction 
um, validly correspond to whichever re-randomized hidden consumed coins are involved in the transaction. And further, that the prover actually has spend authority by possessing the spend key. And the way that we do this in Spark um, is we use a modified Chom Peterson instantiation. Um, and that happens to be linear in the spend key, which is important because it enables very efficient multi-signature operations that are indistinguishable from other transactions. And further, we can also kind of compress this down by using a single proof for all of the consumed coins in a transaction and a constant size proof. So if the transaction consumes W coins, then the proof size scales as O of 1, and generation and verification scales O of W. Um, and even though the consumed coin ambiguity set size might be very large, W is typically very small. Um, and finally, we also include range proofs, like many other uh, privacy-focused protocols use. Uh, we won't necessarily focus a lot on this, but it's worth noting that constructions like bulletproofs and bulletproofs plus are very popular instantiations of this that are very efficient in that they scale logarithmically in size, and while proof generation scales linearly, verification scales similarly to one of many proofs in that it's kind of a, an n over log n type verification, and that batch verification also makes marginal costs of doing a large batch effectively constant. Um, do you have any? Do you want to kind of speak very briefly, Aram, just kind of about the security that we we discuss Spark under? Uh, yeah, sure. So now, first of all, uh, like Spark is a privacy payment protocol uh, has uh, has a proven security in a zero cash type security model, but also all its novel cryptographic building blocks because basically actually it is using few uh, di different modification of existing well research uh, building blocks, right? Like they're using modified one out of many proofs, modified Charm Pedersen proof. And all this comes with their own formal securities. But the payment protocol itself uh, is uh, probably secure in the following model defined by four security properties. The first one is completeness. So which basically means that the honest user should be able always to spend a coin. The second one is the balance property, which implies that the adversary cannot control more coins and are minted or spent to the adversary itself. Third property is non malleability So the adversary cannot meaningfully manipulate or fake a transaction. And the last one is referred as ledger indistinguishability, which means that the transactions reveal no more, nothing other than the public metadata. And the public metadata contains just like the number of inputs and output coins. Uh, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And of course, there's other metadata that's present, like network level metadata um, that is kind of necessarily present in the system. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so finally, we'll just talk a little bit about some future work um, that, that may be of interest for Spark and related research. Um, and of course, there's certainly more future work that can be done, but we'll just highlight four uh, things briefly. The first is this membership proof efficiency. So Aram had mentioned that these one out of many proofs scale very well um, in space, um, but scale linearly-ish in time, even though they can be batched efficiently. Ideally, what we'd want is kind of a complete uh, coin ambiguity set that encompasses, you know, ideally all previous coins that had been minted in the system. Um, and with the current membership proofs, um, it's unclear how to do this efficiently. And while there's other approaches used in other protocols to do this, um, it'd be nice to find one that's still compatible with Spark. The second is multi-signature security. So we talked about the authorizing proofs being linear in the spend key, which can allow for efficient instantiations of multi-signature operations. Um, the paper describes one that uses a kind of a musig and frost type approach, if you're familiar with those. Um, but the security model around the modifications um, needs to be defined and analyzed more formally, which can be complex. The third is an idea that Aram and coworkers have been working on called hierarchical membership proofs. The idea being that you can try to trade better prover efficiency for these one of many membership proofs for space complexity. Um, and that's very helpful as the sizes get very large. But this needs further analysis and, and design. And finally, um, confidential assets. Um, there's been proposals for different types of protocols in the past to kind of support several different independent asset types within transactions in a hidden way. And we have ongoing work called SPATS, which can be found at that preprint link. 
which support independent asset types that's compatible with Spark, um, but that needs further analysis and design as well. I guess, do you have any kind of uh, closing remarks, Aram, before we finish up this presentation? Mm, no, that's true. This was, that's great. All right. I guess we're very excited about Spark um, and look forward to presenting this at the event. Thanks for listening, everyone.